Today's discussion is, are labels like working class and middle class still relevant? Anyone who has looked at the Great British Class Survey or the fact that the majority of British people say they're working class, um, other people raising the point of the 99% versus the 1%, um, if you thought there were some things to be teased out there, fortunately, there's this book. Um, uh, I'll just uh, repeat a few of the things that we've said on the website when you signed up. These are not my words, but they are clever ones. Um, as we know, class has been a definitive aspect of British society for centuries, and it seems that the lines dividing these classes are not as clear-cut as they once were when there was that picture of the guy with the bowler hat and the guy with the flat cap looking down on each other. Um, so I think this is why this book is so important. It takes an angle that um, I know I wasn't expecting and why I'm glad we have two people to talk about. Uh, I would say when I read this and probably those of you who already have will agree with me, there's kind of a light bulb moment on every page. I became that person underlining things, writing, very good, <laughs> well done, Dan. And also, I'll confess a few things where I thought, really, really? Um, so I, I might uh, ask you about that later. Um, it, the interesting thing is, of course, is that this is about a misunderstood demographic between the working and middle classes, and also its relationship to what the wonderful Barbara Ehrenreich and her sidekick John talked about about the pr professional managerial classes and how they're connected. Um, many of you will know that early on in his writing, Karl Marx said that the petty bourgeoisie was on was going to disappear. I mean, that wasn't his view later necessarily, but we're talking about small business owners, landlords, self-employed tradespeople, and artisans. He thought they were on the way out, and in fact, the opposite has happened. So. As Dan talks about, not only has this class continued to grow, but it's played a really important role, he argues, in a lot of political movements in recent memory. The Arab Spring, Brexit, the rise of Trump, and the unprecedented movements around Bernie Sanders in the US and Jeremy Corbyn in the UK. But I have to say, when I started reading the book, I thought I had an, a handle on what the petty bourgeoisie was. And if you do too, you may be surprised by the book. I mean. Can it really be possible that this category includes not only small business people and the landlords we love not to love, but Uber drivers, delivery riders? I mean, you know, even if that's a stretch though, Dan's book argues that the petty bourgeoisie is much less homogeneous than you might think. And so he takes a close look at both the traditional and new versions. So just to say again, I found a lot of food for thought in what it has to say. Um, especially about the rise of solo self-employment, both bogus and, and real, and how factors like downward mobility among university graduates and fear of falling uh, play a role in how members of this group act and react and what it means for our landscape in the UK. Um, you know, whether the interests of the petty bourgeoisie are aligning with the working class, that argument can be made. How significant a factor is housing? Should we be dividing people by whether they own their house or not? And also something that I found really valuable was the discussion of why proletarianization, you know, falling down, is not the same thing as the proletariat. Um, but I know I'm speaking to people who've thought about these issues a lot, and I have two experts on my side, so I'm gonna back off here and leave these two guys to talk for about an hour and then get your questions ready. And thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you so much, Karen, um, and thank you all so much for coming. Uh, it really means a lot. Housemans has like a special place in my heart every time I come to London. Oh, Dick Whittington, that's the guy. Um, <laughs> when you're sort of walking around London and being overwhelmed, um, I always go to Housemans, so it's, it's just a real honour to be doing something with Housemans. It's also an honour to do, be doing something with Tom and Josie and the New Socialist, which is also a fantastic publication. Um, that means a lot to me, but yeah, I'm really, really grateful to you all for coming and giving up your time on a Saturday afternoon. I know the weather's nice. Um, I've got a confession. So basically, um, in the book, I'm arguing that the left or young people should embrace like downward social mobility, which is what I was sort of doing when I wrote the book. Um, obviously, as soon as the book has been published, I've gone like straight back to academia. So I'm like 
trying to be upwardly social, socially mobile again. No, coincidence, it was nothing to do with the book. Um, but me and Tom are going to do like a little back and forth. He's going to ask me a question and then I'm going to ask him a bunch of questions and then hopefully it'll set up a discussion at the end when we can all talk about class, which is really interesting and fun. So um, over to Tom Gann first. I think you can ask me a question and then back and forth. Yeah, thanks. And um, yeah, let, let's just get started with that. So the very obvious question, um, why, why did you write this excellent book, which people should buy if they haven't, because it really is very good. Well, thanks, Tom. Um, so uh, the reason I wrote the book was, uh, it was three reasons. The, the first one is to try to give this, to flesh out or elaborate on this almost the idea of the normal person, you know, this average voter, that if we look at the media at the moment, uh, Keir Starmer, um, I was going to say David Cameron, uh, Keir Starmer, Rishi Sunak, are always appealing to this mythical idea of, like, Middle England, you know, the the, the, the normal people out there, the authentic people. Um, and I thought, well, this this person, this imaginary person, is always referred to but he's never actually, or she is never actually sort of fleshed out or talked about. Um, and what I'm, you know, because this is basically, you know, my experience, my life was, you know, growing up in this small, you know, red wall town, all these sort of, uh, these words that are used to, de to describe this, this normal experience, which I think just wasn't being well captured um, by the, I was going to say, like the mainstream media, by the media. Um, and related to that was this idea, particularly during Brexit, I felt quite uncomfortable because I was in Cardiff University working at the time. Um, and you know, based on my Facebook, because that's back when I still had Facebook, um, my or everyone I knew in Porthcawl, which is where I'm from, um, was going to vote to leave the EU. You know, they hated the EU and things like that. Um, meanwhile, in the sort of in academia where I was. People were saying really, essentially nasty things about the sort of people I was growing up with. You know, they're they're racist, they're fascist, um, and I thought there was a massive gulf in understanding and sort of life experiences between this like small town experience and maybe this, you know, metropolitan academic experience. But I wanted to sort of stereotype either side, so I wanted to firstly talk about that experience and uh, essentially defend it and show that people aren't actually that bad um and they, that you know this lump of the population in the uk isn't actually like innately fascistic because i think that's that's an important starting point if you want to build a socialist project is to realize that people aren't bad people um and then the other experience is is i don't i don't want to speak for you guys but this idea of this overeducated, downwardly mobile uh, graduate that was overrepresented in sort of the corbyn Surge, but also in Bernie Sanders, in movies like Podemos, in Syriza. So these are like the two worlds I was sort of flitting between as I was going from academic contract, being laid off, working behind a bar, and so on and so forth. Um, the second reason was I think that we talk about neoliberalism a lot in the UK. We talk about neoliberalism as just this idea, you know, this this thing that is everywhere and it sort of permeates everything and it. You know, and, and to the extent we talk about neoliberalism and class, we talk about neoliberalism exclusively as something which is a, a transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich. And obviously it is that. But what I'm arguing in the book is that neoliberalism as it came to uh, exist in the UK, which was through Thatcherism, um, is actually inextricably linked with this petty bourgeois experience because Thatcher herself was the epitome, she was the personification of the petty bourgeoisie. Um, and if you look at the way we live today, you know, we, we all sort of live more atomized, individualized uh, lives. There's this rugged individualism that sort of defines the UK. There's like a hardness to the politics in many ways. You know, people are sort of quite, um, can be quite brutal towards each other and quite uh, selfish. And that, so I think that, you know, beyond the actual the formal boundaries of the petty bourgeois itself, the condition of um, the petty bourgeoisie can explain much of modern British politics beyond the class. And then finally, uh, I know I'm sort of rambling, was to just 
open up the debate and get everyone talking about class again, which is obviously, this is what's happening, and obviously there have been a, a raft of excellent books come out recently on class, like Chris Nynam's book on class uh, is really good. Um, and fourth, you know, so I could go, go up to London and things like that. Um, but yeah, that's why I wrote the book. Um, so I'll, I've got a question for you, Tom. Um, why do you think class is so important in the UK at the moment? And why do you think um, that it might not be captured in things like inequality and, you know, in that language? Yeah, great. So thanks, Dan. And yeah, so I think like, I want to start off with, I guess what's like the standard answer to the question. So like the standard answer to the question, um, I think we can almost say it's a sort of empiricist come moral answer that's true but limited and potentially leads us down some bad paths. And I think like almost this empiricist moral answer um, tends to lead to an overestimation of questions of inequality over questions of class struggle, basically. So I want to start off with that and then kind of um, expand on that a bit more. So obviously, like the standard answer is uh, class really decisively shapes people's lives. Uh, people suffer from class. Um, their opportunities are limited by class and, you know, right down to, you know, very obvious physical things. There are huge class distinctions in you know, something like life expectancy, for example. So like people suffer from class um, in all kinds of ways. And I think like that's bad. Um, that's that's kind of a banal point, but obviously this is at least part why class is important, yeah? Um, but I think there's a few more points here to make that, like, of course, other oppressions exist that are not necessarily class or, or, or classed. Um, but even within that, I think we can say that, like... Um, all the categories here are a bit difficult, but like I think as shorthands that I might not want to commit to, but I think we'll get the point across. Like you have movements based around particular identities or movements based around particular other kinds of material struggles, for example, housing, where class is clearly an element of these struggles uh, and it's internal to them. Um, for example, something that strikes me um, on the left in terms of how the left reproduces class um, is how often people from categories that are marginalised, working class people from categories that are marginalised often get ignored. Um, and there's a specific process here, I think. So, for example, like... Um, panels might think getting a woman on is good enough. Yeah, whether that necessarily means a working class woman. So working class women tend to disappear structurally here. So I think we can say within like struggles over particular identities, class has effects. Um, and then I think we can also say that um, even if we bracket these out, there's still like a residual effect of class, uh, even for example, you know, a white, cis, uh, able-bodied man working in the imperial core. And I'd, I'd really want to insist on thinking about imperialism and class as well. Even this person suffers from class. So we've got this kind of double way it matters. Um, so, so people suffer from class. I think, I think we can say that. And I'm, I'm using suffer here, I think, advisedly, because I think, like, sometimes these approaches... Um, how to put this? So sometimes these approaches can talk about people suffering from class, uh, but they then tend to marginalise, say, exploitation or class struggle. Yeah, if we're talking about, say, you know, educational outcomes, we're talking about a suffering from class. We're not necessarily talking about a struggle. So I think this is maybe where this kind of empiricist moral position possibly runs us into a like a bit of trouble. Um, so, I mean, the other thing I would say, actually, is if we take this line, it would actually imply a very different book from Dan's book and a very different event from this one. So, um, what's required to deal with the suffering of class? 
uh, some policy ideas uh, for a government to impose that are maybe balanced with other concerns with electability. Uh, maybe ways of showing that class matters, maybe through surveys, case studies, or more like effective work like literature. Um, the kind of conscious uplifting of working class voices, all these things are desirable, except maybe the policy thing. Um, but that's not what we're doing here. So I want to kind of suggest something else about uh, why class matters. Um, so, Firstly, class isn't only class. I guess like the theoretical tradition I come out of and I think, think Dan comes out of to some extent, like elements of this sort of structuralist Marxist tradition of like Althusser, Poulantzas, and then leading in, I think, to, to Stuart Hall. Um, there's this really strong insistence that class struggle is prior to class. Yeah? And uh, if we go back um, to the very beginning of, of Capital, the very beginning of capital, the commodity as the, the sale of capital, commodity production um, always already implies class struggle. The book doesn't work. Capital doesn't work as an argument if we don't accept this. Yeah? Um, it implies uh, the idea of free labor, the idea of exploitation, the idea of workers separated from the means of production. Um, it implies struggles over aspects of how things are produced. So I think, like, um, I would insist there on the primacy of class struggle. And then the second reason, which is related to this, and against maybe a sort of technocratic egalitarian policy, is there's a question of agency. I guess the, the socialist tradition, the Marxist tradition, wants to say that there's something specific in the last instance because of the inherent role of the contradiction between um, industrial capital and productive labor. There's something inherent and unclosable about this contradiction that perhaps gives us a political capacity to go beyond capitalism. So this is the other reason we, we ought to care about class. Um, I think there's a line, I, I apologize, I was trying to get all my all the quotes I wanted to use are ready, um, but then conditions of a petty bourgeois, new petty bourgeois intellectual. Um, I got offered more teaching hours. More teaching hours is more money. So this got sidetracked. So my, my notes are a little disorganized. But um, So to make the class struggle point, um, in, in Althusser's uh, polemical reply to John Lewis, um, He's kind of taking issue with like a humanist approach coming out of Marxism, the argument like men, and I think we might want to think about some of the meanings of men here as well, that men make history. And Althusser wants to insist, like, absolutely not. Class struggle is the motor of history, and the masses make history. Now, this concept, the masses, is tricky because that implies, and I think this is a really good aspect of Dan's book as well, that implies more than the working class. So we're already posing some questions around class that Dan poses really well about who are the popular masses who can transcend capitalism. But what Althusser wants to insist in the last instance, there is something about the class contradiction that means they are likely to cohere around the working class because of this structural position within capitalism. So I think this is a way class matters. And to make like, the final point here, and I, I wonder if Dan and I have a slight disagreement here, um, which might be interesting to flesh out. So I want to insist on this sort of structural primacy of this contradiction, but I think you can sometimes go into reading this as like appearing in every situation these contradictions don't pop up in every situation. I think there can be like, how to put this, like a class reductionist problem of saying there is an agency re rooted in capitalism offered to the working class. So the, the kind of Althusserian argument or even like the, the Maoist argument is contradict the primacy of contradictions can shift. So whilst there is this unsurpassable contradiction that gives a capacity for agency, uh, 
there are a set of other contradictions that in actual conjunctures, contradictions around race, gender, around broader mass politics, around generalizable politics like democratic struggles um, or ecology, for example, that might have a class component, but they're not directly about class struggle. So I think there's then a question here of, to finish off of how we theorize this, how we theorize the structural primacy of one contradiction versus situations and conjunctures might offer far very different contradictions as the politically vital ones. I mean, I know that's quite a long technical answer, but yeah, that's why class matters. No, it's good. Um, so I, th I think one of the issues I was going to ask you, and we've talked about well, only on Twitter, but what I think other people will be, everyone will have their own understanding of what class is. So one of the things I wanted to do in the book was basically, you know, because we talk about class a lot in the UK in particular, we talk about it all the time, but it's not, it's often not defined, you know, what, what it is. And so I'm arguing in the book that we have to approach class, you know, like holistically, we have to approach it in terms of the economy, uh, we have to approach it, you know, socially in terms of like who we know, we have to approach it culturally, you know, and I mean, there's a, there was a tendency, I think, we'll get on to our take on sort of the left or, or whatever, but um, there was a debate for a while uh, on, I say the left, it's just, it's just Twitter, basically on Twitter, but like, um, you know, people were talking about class and they were saying, well, class isn't an identity. Class isn't about culture. It's just about uh, econ the economy. It's just about um, whether you own the means of production or whether you don't. Um, and in the book, I'm sort of saying, well, I, I sort of sympathize with that, but you can't, you have to take into account things like culture. So in the start of the book, when I was talking about um, my upbringing, because in the book I say that what I grew up thinking I was incredibly posh, um, and I certainly was in uh, in comparison to the the surrounding regions. Um, but then when I go, you know, because when I go play football against uh, the lads, from the valleys, you know, they'd say you're posh or you're English, which was obviously a lot worse um, at the time because um, I had a posh accent. But the point was we started to understand class from a very young age uh, in terms of our, the cultural signifiers. We had different haircuts, you know, our dads, we all sounded different, we had different accents. And obviously this was before, you know, we started work, you know, we were only only boys then. So there is something, and, and as Tom says, you know, class is sort of, um, well, it, it, it structures your life. It's really, um, and it is uh, something that is all encompassing and totalizing and, and you really feel it. You really feel your class, particularly if you feel out of place somewhere. So I'm arguing in the book that we have to sort of consider all these things together. And I thought that in the things you've written, you've almost, you agree with this idea of not throwing culture out uh, in how we think about class. Um, so <laughs> to get onto the bit we've all been waiting for, um, you said about, you know, the, the, this masses, you know, and, and obviously the 99%, you know, we are the, you know, the many, not the few. How, what do you think that sort of the left and by the left, just to define it properly, um, I would say, you know, people in, you know, the, the left of the Labour Party, um, sort of the people adjacent to the Labour Party, the various, you know, Trotskyist groups, um, people, like, people like us, I would imagine. What do we get wrong about class? What has, what has been going wrong in how we talk about class, but also what has been going right? Because I think that's important as well. Yeah, great. So, yeah, I think like I would want, I agree with Dan, I would want to insist on how we think about how we think about a cultural element, how we think about culture and ideology as material as well. I think that, that that would be quite an important part of that. And how in lots of cases, particularly the new petty bourgeoisie, and I think this is, is excellent in the book, like how there's a specific role of culture, the materiality of culture with the new petty bourgeoisie. Um, so I think that's all really valuable. Um, in terms of what does the left get right and wrong, I. So I worry a bit about adopting this posture of like, 
I'm a brave truth teller. Uh, I'm going to denounce the left, not least because I wonder if that corresponds to a sort of petty bourgeois consciousness, uh, like the brave individual outside the collective with some superior knowledge. And I think the, the politics of knowledge of the petty bourgeoisie, especially the new petty bourgeoisie, are a really interesting place where like culture and ideology have a pretty determining role around class. Um, so I'm, I don't want to assume that posture. Having said that, what does the left get wrong about class? Almost everything, maybe? Um, so, if I want to say almost everything, that means I could go on a bit, which I don't massively want to. So I want to make a couple of um, quite theoretical points and then get a bit more um, concrete. And I think like it's always worth kind of remembering here, I think, like, so I think the left makes some intellectual errors about class, but they're not autonomous intellectual errors. The intellectual errors reflect uh, reflect social being. Social being determines consciousness, yeah? Um, so the first thing that I think the left gets wrong about class um, or rather why discussions on the left about class are, are often not very profitable, maybe would be the way to put it, is people mix up uh, levels of abstraction when talking about class. I think this is like my, my big thing about class, to be honest. So um, there's an absolutely great Stuart Hall set of lectures that Duke have put out fairly recently called, I think they're called, they're called Cultural Studies 1983, I think. Hopefully Houseman sells them, go to Houseman's, buy them, that's the, the necessary endorsement. Um, they're, they're absolutely great. And uh, one of these lectures, he starts talking about how, let me find the quote again, disorganized on my phone. Um, yeah, so Hall says that the greatest problems in Marxist analysis have been have resulted from misunderstanding the level at which abstractions are working. So what Hall wants to say is, you know, if you're reading most but not all of Capital One, Marx is only interested in like a very, very abstract contradiction between basically industrial capital and productive labor. Um, that includes huge aspects of class determination as well as like other elements. I mean, as Hall says, um, if you want to define the capitalist mode of production, you have to ignore all the other real determinations. You describe the relationship between capital and labor. You describe what capital does. It possesses the means of production. It locates labor in the free market and it exploits labor power. That's all. There's nothing else. Whether the capitalist is tall or short, brown or white, Chinese or American, is of no consequence whatsoever. That's one level of abstraction. But Hall continues, however, the moment you want to talk about the formation of a particular capitalist class in Britain, the particular way that class has evolved historically, then you have to say a lot about its emergence out of other social and class formations. So I think, I think we often mess up levels of abstraction and if I was being generous, I would say that results in people talking past each other. And I think, I think that sometimes happens with, I think we want to go on to talk about the way Jenna thesis, but where you have almost this. So I think Marx is talking about, in Capital One, about the industrial capital productive labor contradiction. That excludes quite a lot of wage earners uh, are outside that. Um, but we end up quite often in like a debased version of that on the left that wants to say what Marx is saying actually is something about all wage earners and all wage earners are working class. Um, that's wrong. That's clearly not what Marx is saying. And I think that that's a short circuit of level of abstractions on Hall's terms. I think, um, I think the other theoretical point I'd make about what the left gets wrong is throughout the left, I think there's a commitment to a kind of weird mixture of ideo ideology fixation and economism. 
at the same time when talking about class. I think a lot of this is people trying to work through the trauma, and I think we should acknowledge it as a traumatic moment, the trauma of like the 2019 election result. Um, some of this is replacing what I would say in Dan's work, as well as say someone like Pilan Sassel Hall, concepts that are extremely sophisticatedly theorized, but are also essentially strategic concepts. Um, replacing those with understanding, saying, we need to understand class so we can manipulate people into voting for us. That's not a strategic concept. That's a common strategy and a manipulation. Yeah, so I think we, we run into trouble there on the left. And I think the economism argument often gets things backwards. It wants to say, for example, people in London tended much more to vote for the left. People in, quotation marks, red wall constituencies tended to vote for Tories more. We believe in the deter class determination. Therefore, somehow people in London must be really working class. People in the red wall constituencies aren't really working class. Do you see what I mean? And it feels like you have like a political effect and then we've read Marx badly, so okay, a political effect, so there must be an economic basis for that. But as, again, as Hall would insist, there's a whole level of like indeterminacy and struggle where elements of the petty bourgeoisie in particular might go very left um, and where aspects of elements of the working class may vote in very right-wing ways and that might be in their interests. I think that's quite important to insist on. So I think we end up with that. To, to make maybe a, a more concrete point, um, the left's very, and Dan makes this argument convincingly, uh, the left's very petty bourgeois in Britain or actively bourgeois. Um, so I think in some ways sometimes the, the wage earner thesis, every wage earner is working class, it's quite a good alibi for the more privileged sections of the left. Um, well, and this is a point uh, Pilantzas makes. He, he's very insistent that we need a limited definition of the working class so we can pose the question of class alliances. If we say everyone's working class, then a very well-off, very well-qualified person is as working class as someone else. They're right to the kind of cultural aspects that will make them assume that they're in charge are uncriticizable from a class perspective. So I think like sometimes the wage earner thesis, we should be very cynical about it. Um, I think like it serves very vulgar, narrow interests to be personal about this. And I think, I think that's definitely worth saying. And I think like the last thing we end up with, with this kind of like broad and economistic conception of the working class and to, to return to the whole thing I started with. So obviously when you read Marx, capital one, you have this one contradiction. When you read Marx's kind of conjunctural analysis, the stuff on uh, cl class struggles in France and the 18th Brumaire, there's a profusion of classes, but there's very rarely the industrial proletariat. These are essentially, like Dan's book, they're essentially books about uh, contradictions within the petty bourgeoisie and the different political effects of that. And there was, there was a thing that I found in, I found in it that, I, that Michael Denning quotes in a really good essay that uh, might be interesting to come back to, but um, about how if you have this broad notion of class, whether it's like an undifferentiated concept of the popular masses, or everyone's basically working class. Um, the left should always win, yeah? If we are the 99% and we're getting 35% in elections, something's gone wrong here, yeah? Um, so the work of working out like real problems on the indeterminate level of politics basically disappears. Um, so um, Marx says that like, the French left, essentially, I think we can call them the French left in like uh, the late 1840s, we have when a struggle approaches, they do not need to examine the interests and positions of the various classes. They do not need to weigh up the means at their disposal too critically. 
they only have to give the signal for the people with its inexhaustible resources to fall on the oppressors. I think there's an interesting conception that even by 1848, we had a party politics form where a particular section of the people thought they were in charge. Yeah, The people, passive, the French Democrats, tell the people what to do. But what happens when you lose, which they did, of course, um, if in the sequel their interests turn out to be uninteresting, their power turns out to be impotence, either it's the fault of dangerous sophists who split the indivisible people into different hostile camps. Um, some stuff about the army. In each case, the Democrat emerges as spotless from the most shameful defeat as he was innocent when he went into it. And I think, I think this is applicable today to a lot of left class theories, yeah? Um, we have a lot of blaming of splits, often actually where more marginalised parts of the working class might want to assert themselves and have every right to assert themselves. Uh, we have a feeling that sometimes that too much theory is a problem. Um, all people need to know is their direct interest, I guess. Uh, these would be our, our sophists causing trouble. So I think, like, I think that would be the other level in terms of what does the left get wrong. How much does, a, how much does a, an economistic theory of all wage earners a working class uh, function within the left and, and finally function within the left and... I think this is a strand in Luxembourg that doesn't get picked up on much. Like, Luxembourg makes a lot of how um, the left itself, not just, not just like middle class people, petty bourgeois people, bourgeois people enter the left, but at a certain stage, uh, the institutions of the left start producing a petty bourgeoisie or even a bourgeoisie. You know, the leaders of the left, the leaders of trade unions, um, they manage people, they negotiate with the state, they command considerable resources. These people, you know, there's a bad faith criticism of trade union leaders that they earn a lot of money. But I think there is something here in terms of like, how do our institutions not only reproduce class structures uh, by already posh people getting put forward, but how much do they also create a new, a, pe a new petty bourgeoisie and even a bourgeoisie by their positions of leadership and command. And I think sometimes a lot of left class theories tend to obfuscate this. Again, one might think it's quite interested. Well, one, one of the problems I think is, and what I wanted to do in the book, is we, we don't really have a theory of the middle classes. You know, if you talk, you know, when we were talking about the 99% um, or everyone who works is working class, we, we, we've because the left basically abandoned class for about, uh, you could say Blairism, but possibly a bit, a bit uh, before that. Um, you know, we, we don't we back in the seventies and eighties, there were you know Poulantzas, but also the Ehrenreichs that Karen talked about, um, and a bunch of other theorists really tried to get the grips with this idea of the middle classes. You know, who are the intermediary classes? And then as we've sort of come full circle and we've come back to class, because it. You know, it, it, I do one of those things in the book, you know, like, oh, why is no one talking about class? Obviously, people are talking about class. The problem is, is that, you know, when, when we, we've come back to class, we haven't got these theories of the middle class and sort of how they act politically. And therefore, we keep talking about, oh, well, we're all working class because we all work. And that's obviously a crude, uh, a crude overview. But that is, you do hear people say that, like, I work, therefore I'm working class. And we haven't got this theory of the middle classes. And one of the problems in the way we understand class, I should have spoken about this earlier, but one of the ways class is understood, particularly in the media in the UK, is obviously being about culture. You know, it's all about culture, so culture is important, but obviously if you look at, you know, if you read Joe Kennedy's book, Authentocrats, you know, if class is about you know, your consumption habits and your accent, that's why you have people like Owen Smith and things saying, well, I'm working class because I drink, I don't drink cappuccino, and then all these young people, they're middle class because they eat avocado and things like that, and, and middle class just becomes totally meaningless and working class just becomes totally meaningless because it just becomes about the things you consume or the way you talk and things like that. So the way I theorize the middle classes in the book is I think the middle class is split. 
I think is split into sort of two. I think there's the petty bourgeoisie, or the, you know, the lower middle class. Um, I don't know if we should talk about like the new petty bourgeoisie maybe in, in a minute, but um, so I think on the one hand there's this like lower middle class, and then on the other hand I'm saying there's a the upper middle classes which uh, the Ehrenreichs uh, talk about as the professional managerial classes. So that would be like the Kia Starmers of this world and sort of the, the managerial classes. But I think um, we have to be clear that the middle class isn't homogenous. You know, it, it contains like fractions, it contains splits. And that's really important uh, in, in how to understand how people act politically and how people relate to one another and, our, our, and sort of our own position. So, um, <laughs> I was gonna say without hurting my feelings, Tom. Um, but do you, I mean, just just to clear clear up what I what I mean by the petty bourgeoisie. So I think the petty bourgeoisie has two strands. So the first strand, so it's it's like a DNA, you know, the DNA double helix. Um, like I've said this before, but I don't actually know anything about DNA. <laughs> but it just it, yeah, it are, but it, but it looks it just looked like at the time a really good way of explaining something which had two parts. You know, it could be like yin and yang or whatever. So the first component or the traditional petty bourgeoisie, is this, this idea of the small, solo, self-employed. The self-employed. And the self-employed have grown enormously during neoliberalism. It's one of the biggest stories in, in the sort of British economy. When Thatcher came to power, there was about a million self-employed people. There's now close to five million. Um, and in places like Greece, Chile, uh, places which have been the most hollowed out by neoliberalism, uh, this informal self casual self-employment has really proliferated and i don't know about you but i really noticed it like during covid people would lose their jobs then they set up this sort of small self-employed business from the house you know selling herbal life or se you know, selling baked goods or things like that um so the self-employed the self-employed so the traditional petty bushes here has massively grown and what i'm arguing in the book is has really changed because now it's an unfortunate um it's a very unfortunate that the self-employed uh, formed the basis of fascism in Germany and Italy, which they did. Um, and therefore, Marxists think, oh, this, and, and if you look at all the political science data around the world and right populist movements, the solo self-employed are massively overrepresented in Le Pen, uh, Bolsonaro, in Golden Dawn, in the Brexit Party, in UKIP, and they're been a mainstay of the Conservative Party since Thatcherism, just really overrepresented. But we can't just view the the self-employed now as this sort of uptight, moralizing, like shopkeeper. Because you know, when I w I was telling people about my my book, my mates like, oh, I didn't know you like shopkeepers so much. <laughs> and I well, I said it's not about you know, it's not about this shopkeeper. It's not about the stereotype of the sort of moralizing middle class self-employed shopkeeper who sort of looks down on the working class is saying that the, the small self-employed is now so big, is so heterogeneous, um, I think I'm saying that right, um, it's so complex now, and more and more, and like the TUC have started to research this, people are, en the, 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 the traditional petty bourgeoisie is getting, it's, gr it's becoming poorer, basically, they're becoming very, very poor, um, the TUC did a big uh, thing on self-employment and sort of argued that the self-employed are in some ways the worst off fraction of society. The other interesting thing is that, you know, back in the day, self-employment used to be this big aspiration. You know, it was like, I can't wait to open my own small business. Um, and it was almost like a calling. But what we're seeing now is people are leaving, f f it's essentially forced self-employment. So more and more people are entering self-employment from unemployment. So if you're on the dole, if you're on universal credit, you'll go to the uh, the job center and they'll say, hey, you know, can't get you a job, but why don't you set up your own business? So the boundaries between uh, the working class and the traditional petty bourgeoisie are becoming permeable. People are increasingly switching between classes because more and more people are working shit jobs and then they're going, how on earth can I leave this terrible situation, I know I'll set up my own small business. So you set up your own small business and that's awful as well, because you've got no pension, um, you've got no rights. So you leave and you go back and we're seeing more and more people are becoming, um, so the class is becoming really complex.
And then the other fraction, sorry, that was a bit of a uh, sort of a rambling way of getting, but, but we're saying there's another fraction to the petty bourgeoisie. So there's the new petty bourgeoisie, which is this downward, um, downwardly mobile graduates. Um, so people working in white collar jobs, you know, uh, there's about 5 million people in the UK who are graduates working in non-graduate sectors. And that's going to get more and more, you know, because th there's less and less movement into the into the sort of professional classes. And unfortunately, with the sort of crisis that's happening, people are going to have to get used to sort of being stuck, you know, for, for, for a longer and longer time, which is really brutal. Um, I know you've written about the new petty bourgeoisie. Uh, I think you know, there's not many people who still use the concept because Poulansas used it in the 70s and he was sort of roundly attacked by like Ellen Miskin's Woods and things like that. This is a useless concept. Um, but it sort of appealed to me because actually I think, and I, I tried to outline in this, this in the book, that if you look at some of the, the experiences of the new petty bourgeoisie, this sort of downwardly mobile graduate, it's actually not that different from the traditional petty bourgeoisie. People are, very, people are really scared of falling back down into the working class. People, whereas the old petty bourgeoisie used to try to accumulate things like, you know, they used to do things like small landlordism or they accumulate property to try to stop themselves from falling down to the working class. The new petty bourgeoisie accumulates things like cultural capital. You know, yes, I might be working in a cafe, but I like French films, or I like you know arty hip hop, or things like that. So there's other ways in which people sort of differentiate themselves from the working class. Um, but the other thing as well is that we're I argue in the book, and I know Tom said it as well, is that the the way new petty bourgeois led movements across the world act politically. So the Arab Spring, Corbynism, the Sanders movement, sort of behaved in a chaotic manner as well. They sort of behaved in the chaotic way that the traditional petty bourgeoisie used to, used to behave. So I'm just wondering if you could just what's the what's the point in the concept of the new petty bourgeoisie? You know, what's the utility of it? Yeah. So I think there's a a few things. The first thing I'd want to say is like um, I think the 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 point I was making before. I think it's it's valuable to particularly strategically in terms of the question of alliances to. Um, say there are parts of the popular classes who are also wage earners who are not working class. Um, I think like there's a, a strategic value to that. Um, and I think it's quite a useful corrective of, of a lot of stuff. I think, I think it, do, as you're saying, Dan, I think it does a lot of good uh, in explaining certain political movements. Um, so one of the things I'm interested in, um, in particular, is um, not just housing, but I think housing's the clearest example in terms of political movements constructed around housing. So, um, if we go back to the housing cr the housing question by Engels, um, there's a really sharp line in it um, where Engels says that basically it's a historical invariant, not not just in capitalist society, but there are particular capitalist pressures that mean this, that the most exploited classes live in bad, unsafe housing. That's that's pretty general. Um, and Engels says the housing shortage only gets talked about because it started affecting the petty bourgeoisie too. So I think there's a question about like what kind of struggles register. And I think a conception of the petty bourgeoisie and particularly the new petty bourgeoisie uh, helps us a lot with that. I think housing's really interesting here in terms of how we think about housing and class, but particularly a politics of it, I think is what I'd want to insist on here. So one of the other points Engels makes is because there is a, a discourse and a set of arguments on the left that naturalizes the bad housing of working class people a lot of the solutions that are posited are solutions that are good solutions for the temporarily embarrassed petty bourgeoisie and upper sections of the working class. Really strikingly, well over 100 years before Thatcher, the, the big thing Engels criticizes is various movements for working class people and petty bourgeois people to buy their own homes um, as a resolution to the crisis. And, and one of Engels' big arguments, and I think we can also work this into some arguments about borders, ironically, is 
capital wants to restrict the mobility of the classes it exploits. Um, if you've got a house, it's harder to move. You can't move somewhere else where wages are better. Uh, strike action is difficult because your, your mortgage messes you up. But obviously, the relative immobility also applies, I think, to, to some arguments around borders as well. Um, so I think that's one side of this. And then to talk about housing a bit more, um, there's a concept Marx uses in the, the two texts on France that I was talking about and then then drops. I'm agnostic about whether it's useful or not. And he has this concept of secondary or subordinate forms of exploitation. So the main site of exploitation is surplus value, blah, blah, blah. We all know this. Um, but he starts thinking in these texts, um, how much my housing debt and mortgages, um, yeah, housing rent, mortgages, uh, other forms of debt, how those might function as forms of exploitation. And the move, again, exactly as you're saying, Dan, the movements these produced were, were very strange, incoherent movements. Um, and I think another thing I think sometimes the left gets wrong about class to add another thing is the left thinks everything material is about is class, but actually it's not. So renting is not a class relation. Like I would insist on this very strongly. Um, renting is uh, how to put this. Renting is like quantitatively bad for the working class rather than qualitatively so. Like a renter is struggling uh, because. A working class renter is struggling more than a petty bourgeois renter because they have less money and they're spending a greater proportion of their income on rent. Um, but that's not like a structural class struggle contradiction. And I think sometimes that produces movements around housing that are a bit, a bit strange and incoherent. Um, so I think that's an area where it's really valuable. And I think there's a, a lot of work, particularly in the Denning stuff, about um, how movements around secondary forms of exploitation are often petty bourgeois led. Um, and the petty bourgeoisie in these movements tends to sort of hegemonize the working class because petty bourgeois people and working class people suffer similarly from bad housing, from expensive housing. And I think that can have hegemonic effects and those movements can then split based on the capacity for concessions to elements that are closer to the state. For example, the house buying problem. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, of course, and, and housing is an, in, I mean, there's a chapter in the book on housing, and if you're living in London and you're a young person, presumably housing is close to your heart because housing's so expensive, just like it's becoming expensive in pretty much every city in the UK, and, and more and more people are forced to rent. And renting is a great example of this you know, it's where downward social mobility is most, is crystallized, because it's such an awful experience a lot of the time. You know, if, you, if you're like me and you sort of, you want it to be an academic, you want to be successful, you want to own your own house, and then what's happened basically since graduation is a process of adjusting your expectations downwards. So it's like, okay, now I'm not gonna own my own house, but maybe I, you know, I, I won't be homeless, uh, so I'll just keep renting. Um, but what I sort of argued in the book about the new petty bourgeoisie and how it sort of crystallised around housing, and this is the last thing we'll do about the new petty bourgeoisie before we move on, is that I mean Danny Dolan has a great a uh, great line in one of his books, and he said, you know, the, and what is going to happen at the moment, I think, is going to be a split. So, for a lot of the young people, and not everyone, you know, not everyone doesn't doesn't apply to everyone, but for a lot of the young people who are active in like things like Acorn or in tenants' unions um, who can't own their own house, a lot of people do actually have housing wealth in the families. There's people who are sort of upwardly mobile and have moved to London, but back in the regional towns they've come from, their parents probably own their own house. The problem is the parents are living like 40 years longer than they used to. So people are being denied because they're not gonna get inheritance, they're not gonna get a chance to get on the housing ladder until you know, 20 years later than they should have. Um, but the point is eventually this will happen. Eventually a lot of the people who are now saying I'm a tenant, 
my life's never going to get better. These people will actually come into a lump sum of money through inheritance or something like that. And a lot of people do have housing, housing wealth. So, you know, one of the reasons I was confused about my own house is I was renting for so long. But my, you know, so I'm like, oh, I'm, you can almost live out your sort of proletarian fantasies. I'm living in a tenement. I'm living in a, a dump, which I, wa which I was. I'm not now. I'm living with my partner. It's just a lot better. Um, but the reality is, you know, m my parents own their own house. You know, so at some stage, I'm not saying I want my parents to die or anything like that, but like at some stage, you know, there is wealth in my family. And, and one of the interesting things that Mike Savage talks about is that cultural capital, economic capital, these things are accumulated histories. You know, it's not just something that you, it's not like a roulette table where everyone has just turned up to the table and they've got an equal chance. People have family histories that go back and sort of, you know, we, we're not starting from scratch. We've all got, um, but anyway, it's a way of illustrating this, this idea that actually the housing stuff and people's class might be a bit more complicated than, than they, they make out. But um, we'll, we'll have some questions in about f five minutes, Karen, is it? Um, but just to, just to close off from us, I think um, at the moment in politics, you know, if you look at British politics, um, you know, normal man or the petty bourgeoisie are being invoked at the moment by both parties. You know, the Conservative Party and the Sunak are quite clearly like the party of the capitalist class, quite clearly the party of sort of professionals. And Sunak's obviously panicking, so he's brought in someone like Lee Anderson to talk about like the death penalty and uh, being really racist because they think that this is the way to appeal to normal man, the petty bourgeoisie. But you know, and rather than opposing this, Keir Starmer has gone along with it because he obviously thinks that there's the, the average person out in the red wall is actually really racist and really reactionary. So he's, they've just got in an arms race. So I think this like normal man, the petty bourgeoisie is central to modern politics as everyone's trying to appeal to them. Um, but I was just wondering, Tom, like how would you see the sort of, you know, the current balance of, of forces, you know, the, the cl to use the sort of, I was going to say posh, like the wanky term of putting, um, you know, what's happening in terms of the class and, and the class alliances that need to be built at the moment. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I was thinking about this and like, I don't know. So one thing was like, a couple of, you know, a few years ago, this would have, this would have felt like the absolutely burning question. Yeah. It's obviously still important on some level analytically, but Half me can't bring myself to think about. I don't. I don't. You know. I don't. Don't massively care who wins the next election. For example, it's a matter of relative serenity to me. Like both are worse. Um, so I think that's kind of one thing I'd say. I think maybe to put it a slightly different way, though. I think like maybe one of the interesting effects within like Tory politics, in particular, has been. The way in which, like, Tories needing to draw in support from parts of the popular classes has some very weird effects on what Pilantzas would have called the power block. And I think this, this strikes me as maybe the key sort of contradiction that, like, popular classes, especially elements of the petty bourgeoisie, um, they're excluded from the state structurally, but in a democracy, you, they still have effects on the state, yeah? And I think, like, Johnsonism uh, was very much like an effect of particular parts of the popular classes on the state with, with often very chaotic effects. Like, um, as far as we can talk about capital in general, capital in general probably didn't want Brexit. Some fractions did. The kind of influence of the need to bring in elements of, like, the popular classes who did obviously had this absolutely chaotic effect. And I think, like, one of the things that interests me a lot is how much another Pulantian concept, authoritarian statism, how much the current authoritarian statism by both Sunak and Starmer, which might be distinct from, like, some of the, like, quite populist elements of Johnson, is almost an attempt by the ruling class to close off potentially chaotic effects. I don't know if that I don't know if that makes sense. That seems like the most interesting question around here is like uh 
Obviously, Hall has the authoritarian populism concept. I don't think that's very useful for the current situation because the ordinary person isn't... They're not, in, they're not invoked as a potential political actor in the way that, say, like some classical right populism would and even Johnsonism did to an extent. They're, they're invoked as like ordinary, hard-working people. There was an absolutely bizarre formulation by Braverman about stopping the Just Stop Oil protests, about... Ordin it, w it was weirder than ordinary, hard-working families. Um, it was... It's annoying me that I can't think of it. But, like, the people aren't invoked as, like, an active people as they would in a populism of the left or the right. They're invoked as pacifised individuals or families, and the familialism of it's probably quite significant as well, who the state has to intervene to spare inconvenience, whether that's like anti-strike action, anti-just stop oil action. I think even like migrants are increasingly posed as like a problem of inconvenience as well. Um, so I think like that kind of feels like the interesting thing, how you, how both parties are competing over sections of the popular classes that you can accommodate without having to do anything too redistributive, without having to challenge capital that much, but also trying to, like, dampen down any possibly chaotic elements. I think that, I think, I think that seems like the crucial element to me around this. And what we do about that, who knows, really. Do you want to take two questions, though? Yeah. Um, I'm sure we'll have some great questions, if so. If so, I'll be glad to pass the mic out to you. We've got about half an hour. Um, for anyone who would like to talk about these issues. Yes, front row. I'm not sure this is a great question to kick off with, but you've got to start somewhere, haven't you? Um, looking back, Dan, how, how do you... Can I just talk? Can everyone hear me? Um, no, use a microphone because I thought that people wouldn't... Okay. okay. It just didn't seem to not work all the time. Is it me? What, what, do I have to have it right in my mouth? Okay. Um, so, so, uh, no, I'm not working, so just keep on. Um, I've almost forgotten what I was going to ask. Um, looking back, ha how, how do you assess, um, ha thanks. Ha how do you assess how Corbyn or Corbynism more widely, whatever that was, dealt with with class. I mean, I, I can remember that he talked about they talked about the many, of course, um, which is vaguely class related, isn't it? And I I think I can specifically remember that they talked about trying to attract more working class MPs. Uh, I can't remember much else. So, so I mean, you know, I'm not trying to be too harsh on on corporatism because I was a big fan um, and I think they were overwhelmed with problems but just looking back what it was your assessment uh, no yes well I've got um, exactly the same issue as you have in that in the, I I love Jeremy Corbyn uh, I think he was a great a great man he still is well, still is a great man um, and a great MP, and you know I campaigned for Corbyn. I thought it was fantastic, but um, in terms of the understanding of class and sort of how Corbynism as a movement was, you know, the sort of class composition of Corbynism. Um, so I, th I think if you look at left populism, which is what Corbynism was, you know, like around Europe, it was. You know, it was trying to be a mass movement without really often talking about class. It didn't seem to talk about class that much to me. It was like, the, as you said, it's all bound up. It's implicit, but it's all bound up in this idea of like the many, you know, the masses, without actually taking to, into account the sort of the fractures and the problems and the divisions between like the lower middle classes and the and the working classes. Um, and we, well, I, I argued, and I know Tom's argued, that I argued in the book that Corbynism's sort of base was sort of split. You know, it was on the one hand, it was like the, the leftovers of the trade union movement, the, the left of the Labour Party, 
And then on the other hand, and if you look at momentum in particular, the people who sort of propelled Corbyn forward were sort of downwardly mobile uh, graduates. You know, and and, that, and this is the case in all left populist movements. Um, and you know, and th th one of the problems we've got is that, like, so Kia Milburn wrote a really good article for Novara about this, like, you know, radical generation. You know, there's a radical generation, generation left, which has sort of propelled Corbynism. But then he wrote in this article the other day, this caveat, he said, well, only 5% of, like, people under 30 are in, are in a trade union. You know, so there's this weird division where people are very support, radical people are very supportive of, like, the working class. They're very supportive of trade union movements, but they're not actually involved in it. They're not of it. And that's a massive problem if the left is sort of, and you know, I, it's probably the same in London, but if in, in Cardiff, you know, whenever there's a strike, you know, you have the, the, the Cardiff left saying, we've got to get down and support the strikers. You know, we've got to get down and support the working class. But there's already this implicit thing, because, problem, because we're not actually on strike. We're not actually in the working class. We're just doing this weird um, cheerleading role of like uh, supporting supporting it, but we're not actually involved in it. Um, and for what it's worth, I think what's interesting at the moment with the strikes, you know, you've actually got you actually see the power, the residual power of the actually existing working class. If you look at the RMT, if you look at the CWU in particular, these are the last vestiges of the organised working class. And you know, from my perspective, and people might disagree, but What's happened in this very short period of time with the railway strikes, with the postal strikes, um, with the nurses' strikes, it's a far bigger threat in a way to sort of actually British capital than you know, I think they were a lot, the, the state are a lot more scared of what's happening at the moment than possibly they were of, of Corbynism. That might be a harsh judgment of Corbynism, but it seems to me that that's, and that's what's happening at the moment seems to be what should have been happening in 2019. You know, you've got the working class are actually leading this movement and then sort of white collar unions, PCS, UCU, we're sort of falling in behind, but we're not sort of leading it. Um, and that for me is like the ideal, what's almost, I mean, it's it, what's happened obviously is that the unions have been picked off already and we're sort of gonna go back and settle and the union, a lot of leaderships are trying to settle for these below inflation deals. Um, and what, but what really happened was the working class sort of shrugged, and in that small period, like there was, it, the effects were, the effects have been enormous. Um, but for all its strength, Corbynism wasn't, it wasn't that, you know, it wasn't that. It didn't really have that mass uh, working class movement behind it. Um, but the challenge is not to be defeatist and go, oh, you know, all these lefties are middle class. Um, just to be clear, that's not what I'm saying. I don't want to say that um, we have to build class alliances and what actually is happening at the moment in the strikes is a form of alliance building. And that's what has to happen. And obviously, Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party will have a massive role to play in it. But the problem, the difference is they won't, they won't play the, I don't think they can play the leading role. You know, it has to be the work, it has to be ordinary working people. It has to, because the strange thing about the strikes and it's probably speaking, uh, forgive me if I'm speaking for you guys, is that this radical moment that we all thought we would, in 2019, 2017, that we thought we might have been like leading, I'm gonna be the vanguard of this, you know, we're the mass movement. It's been unfolding like without us. Do you know what I mean? It's been happening now and it's just ordinary postal workers, ordinary rail workers, they're doing it, them, you know, they're doing it themselves without this sort of intellectual vanguard, which like the left has sort of become. But the, the future is trying to build, obviously, how can we get everyone together? And that's the hardest thing. I don't know if Tom want to want to come in or should we, should we pass the mic around the back? Yeah. And then... Sh Hi, sorry. I have a uh, I have a question. It's like, uh, especially I want to ask about like, you, uh, like your take on like the the influence of the 
technology development like AI and ChatGPT, like because a lot, like for example, like a lot of like maybe new particular Z like、uh, software engineer and these kind of people, they might be actually replaced by like newer versions of、uh, AI technology. So like it might really like worsen the the, the situation of this kind of falling down from like middle class or to like、uh, proletarian or,、uh, or even precarious. These things, so like, like, do like, I, I wonder, like, do、uh, do you have any like、uh, expectation or、uh, like pr-、uh, predictions about this kind of、uh, the influence of these new technologies on like class alliance,、uh, alliances and class struggles? So yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Can everyone hear me?、Yeah. I can hear myself. Oh God!、Um, sorry, Dan. This one's aimed at you.、Uh, I noticed that you just did the thing that was supposed to be critiquing, of assuming that there's no working class people in the room, didn't you? Because obviously, working class people wouldn't be interested in talking about class. They're all just off somewhere else communicating in grunts and atavistically performing radical action.、Um, so I guess my question is, following on from that. If the "quote unquote" intellectual left, which I would quite strenuously want to argue is not the same thing as the bourgeois left, for personal reasons,、um, is not going to be the vanguard, how can it avoid kind of slipping into a sort of weird saviorism where it's relying on this kind of like lump of like mass, like I say, sort of atavistic proletarian energy to Sort of do the thing for it. Surely, there's quite a lot of stuff that bourgeois people, middle class people, whatever we want to say, have to do. You can't just sit back. They can't sort of nope out of it. That's that's my question. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on like on technocracy and management, like as being kind of central parts of this whole discourse, especially with the kind of. These different factions within the new petty bourgeoisie or whatever you obviously have the kind of new, like kind of yeah, like the kind of downly mobile types who do have a kind of technocratic love of the EU, etc., and so on. Then you also have this other kind of appeal to managing borders and so on. So I was just curious as your thoughts on techno technocracy and management. Cheers. <laughs> We'll both jump in, is it? Um, yeah. So the the chat GP thing and tech is interesting because obviously people always say, "Oh, automation is going to get rid of all these working class jobs," but it looks like it might do away with like lawyers and things like that. Because I know, I know a lot of my friends who are in professional industries are saying that like actually, they chat GP can write like legal contracts. And、uh, if you're teaching in academia, it can write really good essays as well.、Um, yeah,、uh, but in terms of the you know the broader question about the new petty bourgeoisie and sort of falling down,、um, I mean, there's obviously as soon as I wrote the book, you know, there's like this paradox because on the one hand I'm saying, you know, the new petty bourgeoisie are like distinct from the working class, but then on the other hand you're saying, well, they've they've definitely fall they're falling down. So at what stage do they become? Become the working class. You know, I don't think it's appropriate to basically say that someone who is, you know, if you work in a like essentially like a blue collar job, even if you're a graduate, you can't keep telling people you are not working class because you have these cultural signifiers that stop you from,、um, you know, being working class. There's no like line, and and I think that more and more as like downward social mobility becomes a reality for people, and as it becomes Less temporary, you know, because people. What's going to happen is people are going to be like, "Oh man, oh man, like, how, when am I going to get out of work? And you know, I don't want to work in this call center. I don't want to work in this coffee shop. I don't want to work in this supermarket forever." But then, you know, weeks become months, become years, and it just becomes this is your, this is your reality. Like this is your life, and um, and and here I am, and 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 it's quite interesting because in America, like, the Amazon strikes, the Starbucks strikes. A lot of the really great labour organising 
is being done by graduates. You know, they call it, I think, salting is a name, you know, where people deliver, it used to be called salting. This idea of graduates taking blue collar jobs and then organizing um, in them. But what's happening more and more is that there's gonna be alliances between the, 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 the new the new petty bourgeoisie, the Stan Woodley Mobile Group and the working class. And, and the thing is, there's no, there's no other option. What you know? What are people to do? You know, like we have to start organising in in your workplaces. Um, so I think, I mean, in terms of whether it, I think more. I think you're right, definitely, that more and more people will be affected by downward social mobility. Um, whether it's through technology or whether it's just for other reasons, I think it's going to happen. Um, and this, the new petty bourgeoisie will certainly have a massive a massive role to play. Um, but that's going to involve, I think, you know, some some work on the part of the new petty bourgeoisie, you know, because it's, uh, and I, and as Tom and I have both argued, some, possibly some reflexivity about their own class position and the, the divides that do exist between people, because we can't, you know, whether you want to call it a class divide, whether you want to call it a cultural divide, um, I think that these things are sort of felt, and they're felt in individual workplaces as well. I remember when I was, you know, I was, finish my degree and I'm in the call centre, I was in a pub and I'm always moaning like, oh, we should join a union. And they're like, why don't you just sh fucking shut up? You know, like he's just moaning all the time because I wasn't happy with my lot, you know, and I was just like, oh, this isn't good enough. This isn't good enough for me. <laughs> the implication being, oh, it's good enough for you. You know, you, you deserve to be here forever. I don't want, I'm on LinkedIn every day trying to get out, but you know, they, they aren't. So there has to be something that, it, there has to be this process of of recognition that there are differences between this new petty bourgeoisie and the and the sort of and the and the proletariat that they're going to be associating with, and that's going to have to be as hard work. You know, it has to be uh, there's a reflexivity that has to happen. Do you want to come in on that? Yeah. Maybe one thing that I think might skirt across a couple of the points that I think hasn't come up as much as it should have done is uh, thinking about the new petty bourgeoisie's uh, stake in imperialism and how technology might have some effects on this. So um, if we go back almost to like the classical Marxist thing about productive labour, um, a huge amount of production has to happen to sustain a lot of new petty bourgeois jobs, material production predominantly, but not only. Also production of like kind of care services as well. Now, that necessarily I think means that the new petty bourgeoisie are largely an effect of imperialism. Like Prelancis' argument is you, you can't consider like a particular social formation without the imperialist context and the surplus product being generated by imperialism is what sustains a new petty bourgeoisie. So there's obviously a lot of classical arguments in the Leninist tradition that wants to locate the labour aristocracy as the big support of imperialism within the left. I think there are some uncomfortable questions for the sort of morally radical new petty bourgeoisie around their actual stakes in imperialism and in cheapened commodities. And I wonder there if we would have to think, say, technological developments um, around how they might reconfigure skilled work on an international basis as well. How much is ChatGPT, what kind of work is ChatGPT replacing? Or I remember seeing something on Twitter, someone was saying like, you know, they had a job in America and they basically like outsourced the job to someone in Pakistan to do the whole job for them for like about a quarter of the pay and just pocketed the difference, yeah? And I feel like, yeah, I feel like there might be some structures around technology and how much they can reproduce or challenge that, but then what works being replaced here, I think is quite significant and like, is there that stake in imperialism? And I think like, Within and then I think there's a question about like within intellectual labour as a general category. I I wonder if there's a distinction. I'm not sure if these are the right concepts to be made between like autonomous intellectual labour and routine intellectual labour, which might also bear 
quite a lot on questions about boundaries of the new petty bourgeoisie and to come to this question sort of more managerial type functions or more genuinely bourgeois autonomy and kind of routinized tasks that are more easy to replace whether that's by like offshoring or technologically i'm not sure if that kind of makes sense as a sort of bundle of thing i think one thing to say about the manager problem um which i think is a really interesting one is i I think sometimes the Marxist tradition gets in a lot of trouble about management when there's a very easy solution, like we, we're not that interested in like individual people. It's a question about structures and processes. Most senior managers are bearers of capital. They're bearers of the interest and the process of capital, even if they earn wages. They're, they're just resolutely on the side of the bourgeoisie, not just politically, but like structurally in the economy. It's like a it feels like a non-problem, but I think that may then, which I think is what you're alluding to, have quite divergent political effects. Uh, a manager might go right or left liberal on that basis, yeah? I, no. Yeah, just finally on the management thing. I mean, um, Matt, I don't think we've got to grips with managerialism or the, the problems of managers on the left and one of the things if you look at the changing class structure in the UK one of the biggest things that has happened is the rise of managers you know professionals and managers i think about 15 15% 15 of the population they used to be like 5 in the 30s so enormous amount of people are in managerial or like professional roles and like, like when we think about managerialism we often think about you know it's our, it's the manager in the civil service or you know, it's the manage, it's, it's our managers that work like a big boss. But what's also really important is this proliferation of supervisory labour. So what we call, what Marx or Polanski would call like petty, you know, petty management. So just, so if you look at someone like Weatherspoons, they employ people on a bunch of little different grades. So you're not just a barman, then you have a bar supervisor, then you have a shift supervisor. And if you look at McDonald's, uh, my friend was telling me like if you're a ship, you know, if you're the supervisor has got to have like the like the big tasties and no one else could have them. It was like one of the weird perks that they were given to the to the supervisors. But the point is these are sort of ways of splitting workers up, you know, giving people supervisory roles. Um, and one of the arguments is traditionally used, um, and, you know, I see people debating about it on Twitter, is they say, well, those managers don't actually have much, they don't ha have any power. If you're a supervisor, you don't actually get paid, and they, it's true they don't get. It might get paid twenty pence or a pound more an hour, but the problem is, is that that divide, the the ability to sort of dominate or speed up someone's labour becomes ideological, and it becomes felt mutually. You know, already you start thinking, oh, he's not one of us anymore. He's one of the bosses, and then what Palancas would argue is that gradually that person who is also given the petty manager role, they come to identify with uh, workers. And now people might not think that's a big deal, but it, it is, it's actually a massive problem. And if you look at, I mean, the census results is are sort of coming out at the moment, but one of the questions in the census this year was, do you have supervisory responsibilities? Um, and unfortunately I haven't actually found the stats yet, but I'm confident that there'll be a massive increase in the amount of people who do supervisory roles, because that is one of the ways that big business and management, uh, you know, the owners of these companies try to stop people unionizing, try to peel people off from one another. So it's something that the left has to has to get to grips with, and I don't really think we have um, got to grips with it at the moment. Any more questions? Any more questions? Don't be shy. Great. We've got um, just about. We've got just minutes left so uh, I'll with that. Uh, we've talked about quite a lot of uh, productive so I wonder how the creation of middle class theory can help us understand reproductive labor yeah or the sexual division of work um Last call for any more. We have, might have time to fit one more in. Great. Um. Okay, sorry about that. 
I feel like I'm doing a stand-up set now. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, um, it seems to me there's a bit of a tension between acknowledging that cultural markers of class are very much real and we can perceive them even before we enter the labour market and also kind of rubbishing when um, politicians or media will talk about, you know, tofu eating, avocado, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I'm just wondering how best we can actually understand the role that these kind of cultural markers play in a way that might be like productive and profitable rather than just kind of trying to figure out whether they're real and they matter. Uh, yeah, two really good questions. Um, in terms of reproductive labour, um, I mean, the book is essentially a class reductionist book. I don't talk about um, the role of reproductive labour um, in it, although I should. Um, well, one of the ways that uh, reproductive labour or the sexual division of labour was historically understood, which is something I would like to have elaborated on in the book, is this, you know, the, the idea that when you know, women entered the workforce, um, they were the key part of this, the service class, you know, the white collar um, aspect of, of the population was was feminized. It was you know, largely female workers uh, working in as type as typists, as secretaries, and, and that played a massive role um, in sort of sp sp it was, because it's quite uncomfortable to speak about, because it was one of the reasons in which white collar labor was split off from blue collar was this there was a gender angle and there was also this ultra masculinist aspect to organizing from the trade union perspective as the white the, the males who worked in the white collar sector were sort of doing feminine work um which was obviously a massive problem in terms of organizing in terms of you know how can productive, unproductive labor, how does that fit in with reproductive labor? Um, it's just like a, a, ma a massive question. I don't think I'm uh, cap I'm personally not capable, capable of answering that, so I'll probably pass it on to, on to Tom um, if that's okay. But just to just to briefly t talk about your, yeah, it's a really excellent point. And, and there's a problem, isn't it, when we, I don't, you, you sort of rubbish these politicians using these cultural markers, but at the same time, they obviously exist. And you know, and they are intuitively understood by people, and that's the problem when people sort of say, "Ah, oh, you know, class isn't about culture, or this person's being auth authentic." Yeah, they they exist. These these things exist, and and one of the interesting things, and this might be a cop out of an answer, but in terms of how we think about it productively, I mean, Tom's written about like Boris Johnson, the appeal of Boris Johnson, but David Graeber wrote a great thing about Boris Johnson um, and Trump. Um, and it's a way of moving beyond these like cultural markers is that is the idea of the you know the state bureaucracy and this idea of this like uptight manager sort of type and one of the reasons that people liked trump and one of the reasons people liked boris and even to extend nigel farage was because they sort of you, you know they've they're putting two fingers up at this idea of this the bureaucrat at the professional politician at the manager which is what i think sort of keir starmer sort of embodies and which is why i think he's not actually a shoe in to win win the election because people sort of see um this almost proceduralism and one of the things that you know it's not really appreciated when we talk about the petty bourgeoisie but one of the reasons the petty bourgeoisie across europe hate the eu is because of bureaucracy they absolutely despise bureaucracy this idea of the state there's a massive problem in the uk because laborism is associated with the welfare state and even though we all love the welfare state we think it's fantastic the pet you know Stuart hall and a bunch of other people wrote that actually one of the reasons thatcherism caught on is because working class people don't like being prodded and poked and dictated to by by managers and bureaucrats which was which was central to the idea of the welfare state which is central to the idea of laborism um and it's a, it's a massive tension that has to be overcome but it's it, i think one of the ways of of moving beyond that is to think about this idea of the bureau you know the bureaucracy and and who is and who isn't bureaucratic and who has and doesn't have bureaucratic jobs but obviously we can talk about what are the good cultural markers what are bad cultural markers later yeah just very quickly i mean 
I wonder if there's a thing that might actually help unify the two questions in some ways. So, I mean, the other thing that that new left tradition is talking about, um, particularly like some of the Beyond the Fragments writers, is some of the specific appeal of Thatcherism to women was that women were often the ones being prodded by the welfare state, uh, which is a point Hall makes too, but also like Wayne Wright, Ray Bottom and Seagal make. And I think, I think that's a kind of interesting element there of, I think there can be like a, a right-wing discourse that, I mean, nanny state even as a discursive term that imagines like welfareism as feminized and often they're quite concentrations of women workers in those jobs, but often, exactly as you're saying, the, the people being pushed around and prodded very often were women. Very quickly on the uh, gender division of labor question, I wonder, I would also think we, we might want to insist on the very extensive role of women in production too, though. So I think like one of talked about some of this stuff before, I think you have this argument that like, emerging in the 80s, that I think Dan was alluding to, that we're, the working class aren't, are no longer, either we don't have to talk about class or the working class is no longer the classical figure of the white factory worker in the imperial core. We need to give up on a centralized concept of productive labor. Ironically, of course, this happens when a load of factory work gets offshored outside Britain, um, which also sustains new petty bourgeois developments, as I think I was saying before, um, and is increasingly done by women as well. So I think there's obviously a tradition of women doing factory work. I know like uh, Josie, Josie Sparrow did a really good thing at TWT and a really good uh, piece for New Socialist, like trying to excavate this figure of like women's productive labour and capital. So there's the social reproduction critique of capital. Marx doesn't talk about social reproduction. But the interesting thing is there's a really extensive analysis of women's work, particularly women pulling canal boats. Uh, so like waged women's waged work and the kind of bit of transport work that is productive in terms of those interminable debates about whether transport's productive or unproductive work. And I think there are some issues there about how like the domestic produces certain skills that produce women as being ready for factory work. Maria Myers has some, some really good stuff on this about what are the processes that produce the kind of valued docility and nimble fingers that allows bad pay for women as factory workers. And here, obviously, to go back to the hall, we're talking about gender as a really decisive determination of how factory work works and productive labor. And the last point I'd make on this as a speaking here, slipping back speaking here as someone who's done a lot of trade union organizing, including new petty bourgeois trade union organizing, like, there are kind of some specific it, it intersections here, I think, between like gendered questions and trade union organizing. If you're, if you're a trade union organizer, whether that's in um, a factory in Bangladesh or quite a lot of workplaces in Britain, often the immediate problem of management is sexual harassment. So I think here we have some really interesting questions about how actually like shifting contradictions, the organizational spark. I mean, one workplace I managed to organize quite successfully around other things, the organizational spark was a manager who clearly had a woman problem. He was always shouting at women workers and never at blokes. Um, and that was a spark to a far more general organizing. So I think like some of these intersections are like, they can be about cheapening of labor power, denial of promotions, but they're also like, classed contradictions that can be sparks for generic organizing. So I think like, I think there's a lot of valuable stuff to talk about like reproductive flow, but I also think we shouldn't forget, particularly on a global level, the role of women in like very classical material factory production. Thanks so much to both of you. I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time. We're going to have to cl clear the room fairly soon, but if anyone would like to carry on the conversation, fortunately it's not raining, it's quite warm, there's a nice area outside. And um, maybe you'd like to join me in thanking Dan Evans and Tom Gann for today's event. 